And here we are, the point of the franchise where I have little to no knowledge of, though that little part centers on the very game we're looking at today. Kingdom Hearts 2 might have been released in 2006 with Kingdom Hearts 3 just finally getting a release date of 2018, but Square Enix wasted no time filling up the time with a plethora of side games. Well, some of them are side games, others are just as tied to the main story as the number games, and first up to bat was Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. God damn, I hate this name. I just do. I know it makes sense in context of the game's plot, it's fine, but huh, it just reeks of pretentiousness to me, and seriously, it's a fucking math equation. 358 Days was a originally a Nintendo DS title released in 2009, and one I did pick up around the time. A game taking place between the first Kingdom Hearts and Kingdom Hearts 2 that centered on the devious Organization 13. Maybe a little clarity on their agenda, their origins perhaps, to help clear the air. Something to give everyone a little more character development. Frankly, I didn't care and still don't because, again, these guys just don't mean that much to me. I was, however, down for more Kingdom Hearts action on the go, and the game didn't look to have the card battle system from Chain of Memories, so it seemed promising. I picked it up, put about 5-6 to six hours into it, and then put it right back down and traded it for something else. The whole game wasn't included in the HD compilation, you'll only find that the story is represented with both fully remastered cutscenes from the DS game, and all new fully voiced cutscenes that were originally just text dialogue. And though I appreciate the effort placed into the remastering, the presentation is stilted, repetitious, and some plot threads go nowhere because of the lack of proper context. In fact, I hope this isn't your first Kingdom Hearts, because this game assumes you played the first title, Chain of Memories, and Kingdom Hearts 2. It is heavily wrapped within the franchise's continuity at this point, offering connections to point A and B without bothering to explain what point A or B is. Just take my word for it, don't play this without playing the first three games. I guess it's about time for that plot summary, so let's jump in with Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. So if you're thinking 358 goes out of its way to give all 13 members of the organization some proper development and whatnot, nope! Oh god, no. Just a couple of hours in, about half of the cast is sent off to Castle Oblivion from Chain of Memories and get killed off given how events in that game transpired. This leaves us organization leader Zemus, rejected pirate Zigbar, lover of cardboard Psyx, the gambler in serious need of an intervention Luxord, Reno from Final Fantasy VII, the guy who's just here to collect a paycheck Demix, and everybody's favorite nobody, Roxas. But even out of those left, it's really Roxas and Axel that gets any sort of real development. 358 Days Over 2 centers on the growth of Roxas, the nobody of Sora who has no memory of his past life, is soon found in a catatonic state by Zemmus, and is eventually recruited into Organization 13. The bunch of black coats that yearn to collect hearts that are released by destroying Heartless, all in order to summon Kingdom Hearts, a source of unimaginable power that can help the organization reclaim their lost hearts. Again, that doesn't sound so bad, but these are the type of people who are not afraid to kill someone if it means making a Heartless, which they can then kill to further fuel Kingdom Hearts. The other organization members are really just there to show Roxas the ropes on a couple of things and to make the occasional snide remark. Besides that, they're nothing more than co-workers that have nothing else better to do than to sit in the employee lounge and that's about all they're good for. The real meat of 358 Days Over 2 concerns Roxas and how he slowly develops from a zombie that I'm honestly surprised knew how to put clothes on, to a budding Keyblade warrior that wonders what his purpose in life is, questions everything around him, is not sure how everything works out. He's given a name, a number, a black coat, and he's tasked with traveling in different worlds and collecting hearts by slaying Heartless, as his Keyblade holds the power to actually capture those Roman hearts so that they can go straight to Kingdom Hearts. Really makes me wonder how the hell the organization was even making progress before they had Roxas in their ranks, but eventually Roxas begins to form a friendship with Axel, the fiery redhead who takes a liking to the kid, much akin to an older brother looking out for his younger brother. Every day after completing their shifts, the two head to the clock tower in Twilight Town and eat some sea salt ice cream. It's a menial living for a bit, but things start getting a little interesting when a new member of the organization is introduced, number 14, Shion. Though she doesn't say much at first, she shortly begins to open up to Roxas, and since Roxas can relate to the social awkwardness, I believe, the two hit it off fast, become good friends, and begin eating ice cream together along with Axel. But good things are never meant to last in Organization 13, since this is around the time where Sora is sent to the chamber to restore his memories, it starts to have an effect on Roxas. He begins seeing moments of Sora's past adventures every time he enters a new world, a little detail I actually find pretty neat in the DS game, where the top screen is Roxas and the bottom screen is Sora. A little on the nose, sure, but good use of both screens. 
As the dreams continue, Roxas grows increasingly confused and frustrated, not helped by the fact that no one wants to give Roxas a straight answer, not even Axel, who's clearly not down with keeping Roxas in the dark, but he feels it's best for him. Now we all know the reason why nobody tells Roxas anything, but he sure as shit doesn't, leaving him feel isolated at times. On top of this, Shion also begins to have the same sort of dreams that Roxas has. She ends up leaving for a bit to discover some answers, and it ain't pretty. She's revealed to be a replica created by Vexen, one of the organization's main scientists that was killed off in Chain of Memories, very much like the Riku replica from the same game. Zemus knew that Roxas was Sora's nobody and thus contained half of Sora's power, so in addition to recruiting Roxas into the organization for the sake of having the power of the Keyblade under his control, Shion was created to absorb Roxas's power so that Zemus could have the power of the Keyblade under his control. A contingency plan, basically. A little redundant if you ask me, but story-wise, I guess makes a degree of sense. Just by remaining close to Roxas during missions, Shion began to absorb Roxas's power, but since Roxas was also a part of Sora, she also began to absorb some of Sora's scattered memories, hence the occasional dreams and why she looks like a black-haired Kairi. The result of Kairi being some of the strongest memories of Sora's. However, Zemus didn't count on Shion developing her own personality and becoming best friends with Roxas, and once Shion learns that her very existence prevents Sora from fully waking up, and thanks to a couple of run-ins with Riku and his silly-ass blindfold, Shion takes it upon herself to confront Roxas so that she may disappear and return to Sora so that he may fully recover. Before completely fading away, Shion encourages Roxas to stop Zemus from completing Kingdom Hearts, but this request sort of falls on deaf ears because as a result of ultimately being created by Sora's memories and returning back to Sora thusly, everyone's memories of Shion cease to be. A tragic end to a character who, I mean, let's face it, knew wasn't going to last past this game as she was never mentioned in Kingdom Hearts 2 in any fashion, so yeah, you knew something was going to happen, and here we are. But, you know, overall, this story isn't too bad. But poor Roxas, it's like this game was made specifically to emotionally fuck with the boy. He's brought into this world, has no memory who he is, where he came from, but slowly starts to form his own life and make some friends and run an ice cream factory out of business, but he's completely unaware that he's being manipulated by the very organization he works his ass for. His friendships with Axel and Shion are put to the test because of shit out of his control and just when he finally gets the idea that maybe the organization is a bag of dicks and attempts to leave to find his own answers, well that's when Kingdom Hearts 2 kicks off and doesn't go very well for him. It's one of the more tragic stories in the franchise so far. I'm thinking, I know how this kid's gonna turn out because I play Kingdom Hearts 2. This is gonna be one of those gut-punching narratives, isn't it? Hey, at the very least, it's simple to keep up with, assuming you've played the other games beforehand and have all that added baggage. That's what gives most of the story's critical moments any emotional impact and why I think it makes for a terrible starting point to jump in. I'll admit, even I felt a bit saddened by Shion's sacrifice, though personally, I thought her entire inclusion to be redundant. A young up-and-comer that could wield the Keyblade that the organization wanted to use to gain ultimate power? That's Roxas. It's not quite the same, and I realize he's just plan B in case Roxas didn't work out. I just find the concept samey, sort of cheap, and borderline run-of-the-mill fanfiction. She's a secret 14th member of Organization 13 that looks like Kyrie and can wield the Keyblade. Yeah, still, when she bites it at the end and you can see her memory slowly fading away, I felt something. Because she went and made what she thought was the right choice under circumstances she had no control over, and I knew this was going to decimate Roxas, a character I think had it rough enough as is. Shion. Who else will I have ice cream with? That line, though, sucks. As for the other organization members, eh, still on the indifferent side, gotta tell ya. Unless their name is Axel, they don't branch out much from the personalities that were already established in Kingdom Hearts 2. A lot of them are just there. Zemus, Demix, Luxord, Zigbar, yeah, they're definitely part of the organization. Now there was something I found oddly intriguing between the Axel and Syax dynamic. The two are implied to be in cahoots with some ulterior motive given past experiences they had most likely. Syax believes that their leader Zemus is hiding something from the organization, he's just not sure what. Though I think Syax personality wise is exhilarating as tofu, I can't help but feel a little captivated by that loose end. And it's not like it affects the entirety of the main plot, so maybe that's why it doesn't bother me as much as before, or maybe I'm just numb to the whole thing. Kinda hard to tell. Either way, 358 Days Over 2 manages to tie the first three games together well enough without completely rewriting rules and all that. I just hope you weren't expecting the whole organization to get some development, and the whole Disney Final Fantasy crossover element that defines the whole series is, is really downplayed here. Because the organization work in secret, Roxas has little interaction with any returning Disney characters making them feel more insignificant than ever, and the only bit of Final Fantasy we get here is the Moogle that runs the synthesis shop. That's it. Mickey Mouse, though, he's being the king of Disney, knows how it works, still gets that top billing despite him being in only one scene. So is this, is this where I talk about the game now? <laughs> the story is just fine. It's just the gameplay that supplements it. You want to know why I put it down after only six hours originally? 
All right, let's 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 jump in. As part of the organization, Roxas is tasked with traveling to whatever world he's assigned to, to maybe slay Heartless and collect the captive hearts, perform some basic reconnaissance to learn more about the world around him, collect a bunch of emblems as part of a fitness exam, and maybe hunt down a certain number of things to fulfill an arbitrary quota. Afterwards, you watch Roxas and friends eat some ice cream, return to your base of operations, watch the day counter go up, maybe see if some plot unfolds, and then you choose your next mission. This is the entire game. This is the entire game. And 358 Days Over 2 is close to 30 hours long. It is longer than the first game, and about as long as the second game, with much less to do. No gummy ship missions or gummy ship building, no other side games, no optional cups to win at the Olympus Coliseum. Your routine involves one of the stipulations I mentioned earlier in all the worlds you visit, and if you want something a little extra, you can try those very same missions again with a different stipulation, like a time limit or a win condition. Yeah, the game also has a mission mode where you can select one of the 13 organization members and perform the missions that way. If you have a friend that has a copy of the game, you can play some co-op, which I'd imagine would be pretty neat. But this sexual can of spam is all alone for this adventure, so I can't experience any of that shit. I mean, if you have a favorite member of the team, I suppose it is cool to pick them and see how they stack up. After completing enough missions, you can even unlock characters like Donald and Goofy. Now, I think this is a neat bonus for the sake of variety, but these are still the exact same missions from previously, and for some reason they still use the game's cutscenes from the game's main campaign. All right, Rox, it's time to teach you how to collect some hearts and destroy some heartless. Sounds great, Axel. Go get them, Donald! On the plus side, rewards you get in mission mode carry over to your main file so you can spend the time here to help boost yourself for the same old shit you'll do over there. It's best to think of 358 Days as sort of a hodgepodge of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, though definitely leaning more towards the original Kingdom Hearts. You won't be pulling nearly as much flippy shit as Sora could do in Kingdom Hearts Hearts 2, there's no reaction commands for nifty counterattacks or defensive maneuvers, there's no Disney characters to aid you on your quests, and no added drive forms to give your combat skills different levels of flexibility. Roxas also doesn't have an MP meter, so he has to rely on a lot of items to restore his magic attacks or to heal himself. Now when Roxas takes enough damage, he can perform a limit break, which lets him go a little nuts with the attacks for a short amount of time, but that's as close to Kingdom Hearts 2 as you'll get. Your aid comes in the form of whatever member of the organization you're assigned with for that particular mission, and I'm sort of on and off with them. Early on, they can amount to jack and shit just standing there doing fuck all and other times they pull their weight just fine. I don't know, their AI seems too random for my liking. So I find it best not to rely on them for emergency healing and support. I know I complain about Donald doing stupid shit all the time, but at least he always did something and I could manipulate that to my liking. That's not quite the same in this case. As you press on, Roxas can earn materials, heart points, and money by defeating Heartless, all of which can be used in the synthesis shop between each mission to get new weapons, more magic, and restorative items represented by these panels. This is where 358 Days decides to get unnecessarily creative. To even use the stuff you get in shops refined by completing missions, Roxas needs to have a vacant spot in this grid. Now, more spots open as you continue through the game, it's just, when you need to adjust to a different playstyle, say you want to go for a more magic-centered form of combat this time instead of the slow-ass three-hit combo, that means removing panels and replacing them with others, all while trying to fit within the current space allowed, as some panels have more than one block to fill. It's like you're playing a puzzle game with your inventory. And what's even more head-scratching is the experience you earn from killing Heartless is also something you need to equip. Yeah, when you level up, it's not as if your stats just go up, you know, as it always has been at this point. No, you get a level panel, which you need to then place inside the grid to even get the benefits. So unless you're intentionally playing at a lower level for maybe some added challenge, you have to consider level panels in addition to the limited space you're stuck with. This isn't fun, it's cumbersome. I'm pretty sure I spent a good 20% of my total game time just fucking around with my inventory. But when I got a new keyblade or a couple new spells or maybe something like dual cast or triple cast, I wanted to try them out as soon as I could. But now I have to adjust all these panels accordingly. In other games, it was as simple as turning something on or off. I, I don't get this change, I really don't. After about six hours of game time, I've seen just about every type of mission the game had. Shit, the first two hours was wasted on the game's borderline obnoxious tutorial segments. And I had to have seen Roxas eat a whole fucking truck of sea salt ice cream. It's a miracle these kids don't have type 2 diabetes by the end of this shit. And it never gets any better. No matter the world, no matter what happens in the story, it's the same shit. And I mean that in two ways. Every world in 358 Days has been done before, with the exception to Neverland, which actually takes place in Neverland this time. Every world is no different than what you've seen previously in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. And I get it. I mean, it wouldn't make sense if Beast's Castle looked differently than it did in Kingdom Hearts 2, but that only helps cement the feeling that I'm playing a lesser version of both Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, with none of the high points of either game. At this point, I am sick of Agrabah, Halloween Town, the Olympus Coliseum, oh my god, Twilight Town, Jesus Christ, Twilight Town. 
I know a part of it could be because I'm playing these games back to back somewhat, maybe I'm burnt out. But no, 358 days is very much stagnant in creativity. I wanted to put the game down several times throughout the recording, and at one point during a mission in Neverland, I fell asleep. I fell asleep. Not even Chain of Memories did that to me. This game is so boring. The consequence of having such a tedious mission structure making every world feel like they overstay their welcome, compounded by the fact that you jump between worlds too fucking often. For a while, I thought the setup was like you do this, you do that, and then the world ends when you defeat the giant Heartless. But no, another mission can pop up later for that world, and it's the same shit as before. Come on, man. And I get it. The mission structure is perfect for a handheld device. I understand why it was chosen. You can play this game on the go, and then maybe after six months of bus rides, you'll finally finish the fucking thing. For the love of Christ, do not marathon this game, because it falls apart fast if you spend more than two hours on it at a time. Considering how awfully monotonous it is. There was no reason to make it as long as it was. And though I think the story is perfectly fine, playing these types of missions ad nauseum just to experience it is not worth it. Technically, yes, the game looks good for a Nintendo DS title. I love the soundtrack, that's because a lot of them are just compilations of tunes from previous games. And the action can be just as fast paced as previous entries, at least in small intervals. It's mechanically functional, it's Kingdom Hearts the way I recognize it, and that's good, but much like, say, Star Fox Command, you don't do much here, and it's close to 30 hours long! <laughs> what the hell? This is probably why the actual game wasn't included in the HD compilation. The story was the best part of the game, they knew that, and they wanted to spare you the trouble. But even so, like I said before, the presentation of the compilation is not so much a movie, rather a collection of scenes with some text thrown in between them to fill in the blanks. It's very stilted. So for whatever reason you want to play this game as originally intended, you will still need to hunt down a physical copy of the game and have a Nintendo DS. Otherwise, get the compilations if you got a PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4. I had a feeling this would be one of the low points of the franchise so far, but in my opinion, that's all the more reason to look forward to the next game. The uh, handheld adventures didn't stop with the Nintendo DS, for the PlayStation Portable also got a slice of the love, and unlike 358 Days, I don't have any prior history with this one, and I'm... and... In a way, that's why I'm really looking forward to it. So I will catch you guys next time with Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. And I'll be looking at the Final Mix version as part of the HD compilation. It's just a fantastic collection, it really is. You really should get it if you're interested in the series. But with that said, I'll catch you guys next time. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care. I got the outro a little wrong, didn't I? Well, that was a good take. I'm not doing it over. <laughs> Hey, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Shade1602 for the lovely commission piece you made me an Organization 13 member. Look at that fucking full head of hair. You can consider me the, the Organization's janitor, Jackson. I love that name. You can find a link to her social media pages in the description below. Give her a visit and commission a piece. Help a fellow artist out. I'll see you guys for Birth by Sleep.